In this video, we're going to break down a legislative history into its individual documents. This picks up at step four in our step-by-step -step process for researching legislative histories. We first talked about the documents that make up a legislative history in the context of the legislative process, starting with the introduction of a bill and ending with the executive signing or veto statements. Here we revisit those documents in a succinct list. We will take each one of these in turn. In step four, we identified a critical piece of information for beginning legislative history research as the descriptive information for the statute. So you will need the bill number, the public law number, and or the statutes at large citation to get started. As an example, we will use the Lilly Ledbetter Fair Pay Act of 2009. If this is the starting point for my research, then my best course of action is to use the popular name table to locate the identifying information I need about the law to begin my legislative history research. The images here show the popular name table entries for this law on both Lexis Plus and Westlaw Edge. Here you can see the public law number and the statute's large citations. To go back further in the legislative process, I can click through to view the public law and find the last piece of information I need, and that's the bill number. Here, that's Senate Bill number 1A1. However, it's not necessary to have a subscription to a research platform like Lexis or Westlaw to find legislative information. Another option that is user-friendly and freely available as a service from the Library of Congress is congress.gov. This image shows the results of a search for the name of the legislation on congress.gov, where I find the public law number, the bill number, and the other descriptive information about the law that I need. Once you have the identifying information about the law, you are ready to tackle step five and decide which documents in a legislative history would serve your research plan and where to find them. We're going to refer often to three specific sources, congress.gov, govinfo.gov, which is another freely available source, this one provided by the GPO, and finally, ProQuest Congressional. You've already heard about ProQuest Legislative Insight as a source for compiled legislative histories. Think of ProQuest Congressional as the counterpart for searching for individual documents. As a subscription platform, you'll find that its offerings are more extensive and the scope of its digital collections is far greater going back as far as 1789. For the rest of this video, we'll walk through the characteristics of each type of document and then where they can be found among these sources. A version of these slides is available as a reference for this information later. A bill is a proposed law presented to the legislature. Anyone can draft a bill, but only a member of Congress can introduce a bill. In your research, you may encounter many drafts of a bill as it is revised throughout the legislative process. A comparison and analysis of the varying drafts of a bill can be an informative step in legislative history research. Knowing what components of a bill were once included, but then removed or vice versa, speaks directly to legislative intent. An engrossed bill is a term used for a bill as it passes one, but not both chambers of Congress. An enrolled bill is a bill which has passed both the House and the Senate in identical form and is ready to be sent to the executive. Bills may be found at congress.gov, govinfo.gov, and on ProQuest Congressional. A hearing is a meeting of a congressional committee generally open to the public to take testimony in order to gather information and opinions on proposed legislation, to conduct an investigation, or review the operation or other aspects of an agency or program. Hearings may produce transcripts, which are documents used in researching legislative histories. Those who testify at hearings may have varying levels of expertise, express varying viewpoints on the issues at hand, and with that, bring their own biases to the process. This impacts the overall persuasiveness of a hearing transcript as a secondary source. Regardless of their persuasive value, transcripts are very informative as to what information the committee had at their disposal during the decision-making process. Hearing transcripts may be found at congress.gov, govinfo.gov, on ProQuest Congressional, and Westlaw. Committee prints are generally viewed as internal background information. They're usually prepared by staffers to inform the committee while the committee conducts its business. This is in contrast to a committee report, which is the final work product of the committee itself. Like a hearing transcript, 
committee prints give the researcher insight into the information that the committee had at its disposal at the time. They're excellent sources for statistical and historical information and for analysis of the pros and cons of various parts of the legislation. Committee prints are available from ProQuest Congressional and GovInfo.gov. Committee reports are the most persuasive document in the legislative history. Committee reports articulate the rationale behind the committee's recommendation with regard to legislation or other legislative action, as well as the text of the bill. Reports are issued by committees in both the House and the Senate. Of the various parts of a committee report, two are particularly useful. First is the section-by-section -section analysis. The section-by-section -section analysis explains the purpose and meaning of each provision of a proposed law. This speaks directly to legislative intent. Second is the minority statement, which you'll find when there is a disagreement among the committee members as to the recommendation, and this is useful for understanding the diverging viewpoints within the committee. Committee reports are numbered separately for the House and the Senate, starting with the number of the Congress that issued the report, a hyphen, and then the chronological number of the report in that session of Congress. The example shown here is a report from the Committee on Education and Labor submitted in response to the committee's deliberations on the Lilly Ledbetter Fair Pay Act. In the top right corner, you see the report is numbered 110-237, meaning that this is the 237th report from the 110th Congress. And this would be styled HR 110-237. Committee reports may be found at congress.gov, govinfo.gov, on ProQuest Congressional, Westlaw, and Lexis. Floor debates on a pending bill may occur at almost any stage in the legislative process, but typically take place after a bill is reported out of committee. Amendments may be proposed, discussed, accepted or defeated, arguments for or against passage are made, and explanations of some unclear or controversial provisions are offered. Records of congressional debates are published in the Congressional Record. The Congressional Record is a full text record of the floor debates, but it is not a verbatim record. There is a rather liberal editing policy. Much of what is published in the Congressional Record is an extension of remarks made on the floor after the vote. These comments added after the fact are not indicative of legislative intent because they were inserted afterwards and never considered by the legislators as they prepared to vote. Added materials are marked by bullets or typeface in the publication to distinguish from verbatim transcripts of congressional debate. Even though the congressional record has limitations to help researchers understand legislative intent, at times it can be all that's available for amendments made on the floor. If an amendment was proposed, considered, and voted upon on the floor, then the congressional record may be the only record of its intended purpose. This is also an important time to recall that legislative intent refers to the legislature as a whole and not any single legislator. This idea will help you parse through the statements of individuals in the record of floor debates. Among individual speakers, statements of the bill sponsors are most indicative of legislative intent and the most persuasive as the original purpose and meaning of the law. Finally, the Congressional Record is published in two editions, the Daily Edition and the Permanent Edition. The Daily Edition is published following each day the Congress is in session, in two sections, one for the House and one for the Senate. These Daily Editions are individually paginated, and at the end of a year, a Permanent Edition is published. At the end of the year, a permanent edition is published, which is sometimes referred to as the bound edition. In this comprehensive version, the contents are continually paginated from the first day of the congressional session to the last and numbers in the thousands of pages. Distinguishing between these two versions is important for citation purposes. The congressional record is available on congress.gov, ProQuest Congressional, Westlaw and Lexis, Hein Online, and at GovInfo. When the president signs or vetoes a piece of legislation, they may issue a signing statement that explains why the executive branch is vetoing or passing a piece of legislation. This does not speak to legislative intent, 
but it may be evidence of executive intent and how the executive understands the meaning of the law. All presidential documents are assembled and made available in a publication called the Weekly Compilation of Presidential Documents. As of President Obama's administration, that publication is now called the Daily Compilation of Presidential Documents. This is the best place to find signing statements, but it also contains things like press releases, addresses, and any other documents produced by the president in that time frame. Presidential documents are available in all the usual places, ProQuest Congressional, GovInfo, Hein Online, Lexis, and Westlaw. There's one final source for presidential documents that I'd like to recommend, and that's the American Presidency Project. It's something hosted by UC Santa Barbara, and it takes all of the publicly available presidential documents and adds some context and color and some things like FDR's fireside chats, for example. And that finally takes us to step six. After you've identified the documents pertinent to your legal issue, made a plan for where you may find each one, it's time to execute your plan and find what you need.